Um, it's a great pleasure to be here um, today. This is my first BNHC, um, so I'm very excited. Uh, even though I've been working with Bonefish um, for a number of years, this is my first BNHC conference. Um, what I'm going to be discussing today is an ongoing study, so we don't have uh, final results as of yet. Um, however, I do have some interesting information to impart, so um, hopefully you guys will enjoy. So I started out with a very general title um, because this issue that I'm going to be discussing is really relevant to many uh, marine fisheries, not just bonefish. So if you want to think about the, the broad issue, uh, how do we restore locally depleted fisheries? And that's a pretty fundamental question that many places, many people are asking because we're starting to see local depletions and in some cases more broad depletions. So while this question may seem pretty basic, as is often the case in conservation and science, the answer is not so straightforward. If you think about all of the potential implications, things that might cause an area to start to see population declines, there is you know, numerous reasons for those um, depletions. But in a very practical sense, if you want to restore a locally depleted population, you need, to, you need several pieces of information, but one of the most pragmatic ones is where are new individuals coming from? Because to have a sustainable population, you need to have new individuals showing up and surviving, right? Because individuals don't live forever. So this is the, the, one of the most fundamental issue, uh, issues in marine fisheries today, uh, is identifying these potential sources of new recruits when we observe local depletions. And these, uh, these sources, if you want to think about them in a geographic context, may be local. They may be local fish that are self-sustaining. They may be external sources. If you think about the islands of the Bahamian archipelago, it could be other islands. You also have to think, in many cases, more broadly and think really at the region, which would be the Caribbean and Western Atlantic because for many species, they have pretty broad connectivity possibilities. And for many fish species, these are completely unknown. So we can't say what um, the sources of all of our local fisheries are at this point. But this is really fundamentally important uh, for determining the most effective conservation approaches. Because if connectivity is occurring um, at the scale of between islands or more broadly across the region, then if you focus solely on local restoration, local conservation efforts, that may really not be sufficient to restore these uh, locally depleted fisheries. So this is the issue that we're exploring. So recruitment dynamics uh, encompasses many issues, but I'm talking about it pretty practically, um, as I mentioned, sources of new recruits. And if you think about populations and population connectivity, this connectivity is vital to the persistence and resilience of these local populations. And managers tend to focus at the local scale for practical purposes. Um, and really what we're talking about are ecological timescales. And by that, I mean kind of real time, what's happening right now with the fishery. This is the, the focus of, of most management and conservation efforts. However, if you think about uh, population genetic approaches, we can use these methods to infer connectivity, but what we're really interpreting is a slightly different time scale because it takes a little time for genetic differences to accrue. So in, in some ways you could think about that more as an evolutionary time scale rather than a real time ecological time scale. And in population genetics, we have a term panmixia or panmixis that we use, and that refers to the instance where you identify a single unit, and if you think about a population as a reproductive unit, that might occur um, locally or it might be across a region. So in some cases, this has been a pattern that has emerged when population genetic studies have been conducted, especially in marine fisheries. However, if you think about recruitment and all of the things that can go into that, just identifying a single genetic unit across a region doesn't necessarily mean that recruitment is actually occurring in a homogeneous way across the region. Recruitment can be highly variable. 
and it may vary in time and in space for a number of reasons. So what we may often have are really functional metapopulations where recruitment varies between them. And to, to get a handle on this kind of functional metapopulation, that actually requires really high resolution data. So what I'm uh, focusing on for our current study is really one of the national treasures of the Bahamas, the bonefish. And as Justin is going to tell you in a little bit, um, there actually are several species of bonefish that occur in the Western Atlantic and Caribbean. However, we're focusing on just one particular species, Albula vulpes. And the reason for that is that we have determined through previous research that this is the species that as adults occurs on the coastal flats, and so this is the one that's really being targeted by the fishery. Now for those of you who maybe don't know much about the life history of bonefish, it's pretty interesting. As adults, we know they're relatively long-lived for fish. Uh, we've documented them up to 19 or 20 years of age, which is a, a fairly considerable time for a fish to survive. Most of them are not that fortunate. Um, however, that also means they're relatively slow to mature. Um, so for fish, um, this is a, a slightly unusual pattern, but they, they need to reach three to four years of age before they're able to reproduce for the first time. And as adults, they exhibit relatively small home ranges, although they do make migrations to reach their spawning grounds. And for spawning purposes, they form large aggregations that move offshore to spawn, and then they return to their home area in relatively short order, on the matter of a few days. So if you think about adults as kind of homebodies, they like to hang out in their familiar turf. The larvae of bonefish are actually where population connectivity is occurring. And this is because bonefish exhibit a, a very special kind of larvae that's called a leptocephalus. They share it with tarpon and ladyfish and eels. And these larvae are actually fascinating. They, they are planktonic, they're practically transparent, and there's a relatively long duration for this particular larv larval stage. For Albula vulpes, it's roughly 40 to 70 days, so about two months. Um, and what happens is these transparent larvae are floating around in the ocean currents. Now we know that during that time, given the average speed of the, the major currents in the Caribbean and Western Atlantic, that that means larvae could be transported greater than 2,400 kilometers during that duration, that roughly two month, two month period. So if you want to think about that on a map, a bonefish larvae could potentially travel from, let's say, Puerto Rico to the coast of New York. That doesn't mean that all of the larvae always do that, as we know. Um, ocean currents are highly dynamic. They vary considerably seasonally with temperatures. Um, and so that means that recruitment can also be highly variable. Now with bonefish, we know that uh, there are several conservation concerns. They currently are listed as near threatened. And this is really driven by uh, information that we have on population declines. Now this is across the region as a whole, while we don't have hard numbers. Um, in certain locations, we do have um, more and more information that we're gathering to document these localized declines. And this is especially true in the Florida Keys. There's a great amount of concern about local depletions there. But also other areas such as Cuba are also starting to notice in, in certain parts of their country, local depletions, and they're not really sure what the extent is, what the cause is, and how concerned they need to be about these local populations. And as I mentioned, they don't know where the sources of those populations originate, if they're local or if they're potentially coming from other areas. And this is really driven by habitat loss. So many marine species utilize coastal habitats for some portion of their life. For bonefish, they spend a considerable amount of time. So as soon as those larvae settle into juvenile habitats and then later into adult habitats, that's all coastal. And we like to live in the coast. It's beautiful. We like to be near the water. We like to develop those areas. So this is really human-induced uh, habitat loss um, that's affecting this species. And uh, as I mentioned, recruitment sources for these local fisheries are currently unknown. So I've been talking about populations, and that's a term that we often use, 
in a kind of casual context. And, and many people think about a population as the fish that you can see, kind of in your backyard, a local school of fish that you often see in the same location. However, for bonefish, and for many other marine species, as I mentioned, that have this long larval duration and potentially high connectivity, from a genetic standpoint, I'm really talking about effective reproducing units, and that could be occurring on a region-wide basis. So kind of a, a much greater spatial scale than we're used to thinking of a population actually occurring. Now we did some uh, preliminary work on um, population genetic structure for albula volpes, and this was uh, part of my dissertation at the University of Minnesota, where uh, we collected fin clips from albula volpes in the Bahamas as well as the rest of the region. And what we identified was unexpected. Given this high potential for connectivity, you might think, oh, we're just going to find one reproducing unit, as I mentioned. What we actually identified were two distinct genetic clusters. However, these clusters are not separated geographically. They co-occur everywhere in the region, including in the Bahamas. So at this point, we're not really sure what biological sources are causing the separation. One potential is temporally separated spawning groups that may um, allow for this sort of pattern to emerge. But we wanted to go and explore this in more detail. So we're using a multidisciplinary approach that's pretty data intensive and it requires a number of collaborators with different specialties. Um, myself as the molecular researcher, Aaron, a number of others as the ecologists. We're incorporating behavioral and oceanographic data. And we are looking closely at the Bahamian surface currents. Um, as I mentioned, oceanic currents vary considerably temporally and spatially. In the Bahamas, there's um, seasonal gyres that may serve to keep local larvae local, um, but they also may, may uh, function to draw in external larvae. So we're looking at these potential patterns um, for bonefish connectivity. We needed a lot of information in order to even attempt to tackle this recruitment issue. Number one, to look at direct recruits, meaning adults and then their offspring, we needed to identify spawning sites, and we needed to have some understanding for the timing of spawning events. We also needed information on their larvae and uh, the, the time frame for that pelagic larval duration that I talked about. And we also needed to understand settlement habitat for juveniles. Now we're incorporating um, some intensive computer modeling to look at potential larval dispersal patterns for bonefish. And to do this, uh, we actually need high resolution oceanographic models. And then we add in the specific bonefish information that we have available on spawning locations, settlement locations, behavior, and, and other characteristics. And what is um, produced by this modeling is uh, dispersal estimates between the islands. For the molecular data, what we're doing is collecting tissue samples from adults as well as larvae. And we have a combined data set that incorporates um, hypervariable regions known as microsatellites, as well as SNPs, which are single point mutations in the genome. And we're using this high resolution data to look at um, temporal and spatial connectivity patterns um, within the scale of the Bahamas. And we're using this to assess recruitment directly. So I just have a couple of slides with preliminary results from the larval dispersal mod modeling. And as I mentioned, these are preliminary simulations showing us potential patterns, which we're then using the genetic data to kind of ground truth to see if these patterns hold up. And what you'll notice with these three images uh, which are the results of the larval duration, 40 to 70 days for the bonefish, um, from three different spawning locations. The upper left is Grand Bahama Island, the upper right is Abaco, and Eleuthera is on the bottom. So even though the spawning site where the larvae originate are three different locations in these images, you'll notice a striking similarity in the potential dispersal um, that results, and that's given the ocean currents. So against this backdrop of fairly consistent dispersal, there also was some variability. And overall, self-recruitment was more likely than emigration. 
It varied a little bit what we noticed between the sites. As I mentioned, we're so far exploring three locations, Eleuthera, Grand Bahama, and Abaco. Self-recruitment was most likely in Eleuthera as well as emigration. And immigration was most likely in Grand Bahama. So our next steps are to incorporate behavioral data into the dispersal modeling, as well as complete the high-resolution genetic connectivity data to really explore temporal and spatial genetic variability, investigate family relationships between the islands, and see if we can document self-recruitment occurring, and look at potential metapopulation population dynamics in the region. And this has a lot of applications for not just the bone fishery, but also other fisheries where they have a relatively long larval duration, such as the spiny lobster conch and other elapomorphs such as eels. And with that, I would like to thank our many collaborators and um, partners, as well as our industry partners who have been so generous in donating their time and assistance for us to conduct this intensive research. And with that, I will take any questions. <laughs>